All righty. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the sixth annual Clean Energy Education and Empowerment Symposium. I'm Martha Broad. I'm the executive director of MITEI. And it's really great to be welcoming you all here today on behalf of the MIT Energy Initiative and the US Department of Energy, and also with our new partner, Stanford University, the Precourt Institute for Energy, who hosted last year. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about C3E. Some of you know this. C3E was created by and is a part of the Clean Energy Ministerial. The US and 24 other governments share the same goal, which is to increase women's participation in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields, and across the energy sector. It was born out of a recognition that 52% of the world's population are women, and we are significantly underrepresented in the energy sector. So looking out at this room, I can see we're making great progress in diversifying, but there is definitely more work to be done. Ernst & Young does an annual index of women in power and utilities, and the most recent index uh, indicates that 14% of executive managers in the sector are women. Not a real high number, but there is cause for encouragement there. It's increased 13% over just the previous year, so that's a good thing. A uh, perhaps more troubling um, statistic is that 16% of board members are women. However, that number has not changed um, more than 1% over the past three years since 2014. So we definitely have our work ahead of us. And this symposium is about increasing the depth of our bench to take on clean energy, innovation, and discovery to pick up the pace, we need all hands on deck. We've got a lot before us. We've got to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, meet world energy demand projected to double by the middle of the century, and we've got to bring the economy along and create jobs, and we know that that's a, a good thing for uh, the US and globally. So uh, the next thing I want to do is just take a moment to say some thank yous to my staff, and that is Emily Dahl, Kayla Small, and Debbie Kedian, and there are others on the staff at MITEI who have really worked hard to get us here today. Also the DOE staff and Energetics, their consultant, and Stanford, all have worked throughout the months to help us plan and get here. And also to our sponsors, whose logos will soon be on the boards behind me. Um, <laughs> And we want to really thank them deeply. It may sound cliche, but we would not be here without them. So thank you very much. And there they are, a wonderful group of sponsors. So this is a great symposium. And as I mentioned, it's our sixth time. It's amazing the chemistry that we have here. We have women from all different stages of their careers. We have students, some of them you met at the posters outside. We have, of course, our mid-career awardees. And we have senior women who have been working in the field for decades. And we also have people coming at this from different perspectives, which is really a rich, creates a rich and deep uh, combination here. We have people like Connie Lau, who's CEO and president of Hawaii Electric Company. And we have Ala Weinstein, an entrepreneur building a floating turbine wind farm um, in Morro Bay, California. We have Dimpna Vanderlands, a senior director at World Wildlife Fund. And Bobby Cates Garnick, a former Massachusetts policymaker and now professor of the practice at Tufts University. And those are just examples, just a few of the many incredible people that we have gathered here today. And next, I'd like to introduce you to somebody who's also incredible and very special to me, and that is MIT Energy Initiative Director Bob Armstrong. Bob has been a mentor to many, many women and men in his 40 plus years here at MIT, and he's been a big proponent of C3E since the very beginning. He is somebody that is always thinking and talking about C3E as he travels around the globe. 
So Bob is, um, along with Ernie Moniz and Susan Hockfield, established the MIT Energy Initiative 10 years ago and has brought us to this point. And we thank him for all his efforts. And Bob, please join me. Thank you. OK. I'll dance around you this way. Thank you very much, uh, Martha, uh, for those introductory remarks um, and, and for kicking this off. I, I'd like to also uh, acknowledge, uh, uh, as Martha did, Stanford's uh, Precourt Institute for Energy and, and DOE for the key roles they also uh, play in making this happen. Uh, Martha here has driven this activity and, and uh, very grateful for her leadership uh, in this. Um, MITE, or MIT's uh, Energy Initiative, um, is, is MIT's hub for energy. Um, we bridge across MIT's campus to bring together uh, the many different disciplines here, the MIT's five schools, uh, faculty, students, uh, staff, along with a, a set of almost 90 public and private partners uh, from around the world. Um, Bridging those disciplines is, is very important to us uh, because, as, as I think is reflected in the theme of this meeting, diversity uh, is a major uh, aid in making progress in an area like energy, uh, not just diversity of, of disciplines and talents and technologies, uh, but gender diversity is, is very important. And, and I think this, this meeting plays a particularly important role um, in trying to, to bring this much broader talent base uh, to the table. Um, I, I've had the good fortune to live through a, a, a broadening of the talent base in my discipline, chemical engineering. Um, I sometimes reflect back on the fact that when, when I started teaching here at MIT, uh, I would occasionally see a, a woman in the classroom. Uh, today, when I teach, I occasionally see a male in the classroom. <laughs> Uh, we, we passed 70% women in the chemical engineering undergraduate student body uh, a number of, of years ago. Um, and, and it is great to be able to double your talent base uh, in any discipline, and, and energy is certainly one that needs um, all the talents we can bring to bear um, on the global challenges uh, we face. Um, as, as Martha mentioned, uh, Although we are making headway in getting more women to the table in helping us with uh, solving our big energy challenges, uh, there's a lot more we need to do. Uh, and in particular, there's a lot more we need to do at the senior uh, level. Uh, certainly over the last uh, 10 years or so since I've been involved in, in the energy initiative, um, as I travel around, I, I've seen more and more women in, uh, on boards, on, in uh, senior executive leadership roles within companies, um, but we still uh, need to do a lot more. And having this group of extraordinary people and, and talented uh, uh, individuals together is going to play a key role, I think, in mentoring and helping bring the next generation uh, of women into those roles uh, sooner than later, I, I hope. Uh, today and tomorrow, you're going to hear from uh, not just uh, talented uh, women from uh, around the industry. Uh, you'll hear a number from MIT uh, speaking. Um, Amy Glasmeyer, who I'll introduce uh, shortly, um, so I won't say any more about her. Caitlin Muller, uh, whose work helps uh, architects reduce embodied energy in buildings. Uh, Valerie Carplus, uh, whose policy work focuses on developing countries, China and India. Uh, in particular, she's going to moderate a panel on uh, developing countries. And, and be sure to ask her questions in Chinese um, after the panel. One of her talents is apparently linguistics. Um, we have a visiting scientist, Radhika Kosla, uh, who's at the Tata Center uh, right now, whose research uh, is focused on uh, India's energy sector, uh, which is going to be a key in, in the, the world's meeting its, uh, its climate challenges uh, going forward. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, Maria Zuber, uh, who's the Griswold Professor of Geophysics uh, at MIT and also our Vice President of Research, uh, is going to do a fireside chat uh, at the end of the day with the former U.S. Secretary of Energy, um, Ernie Moniz, uh, who was 
uh, Mighty's founding uh, director, uh, and I had a great time working with Ernie while he was here, uh, and I am really happy that he's back uh, at MIT after his uh, service in Washington. Um, with, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Teresa Fossum, who is Special Advisor uh, to Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, uh, and she's going to introduce a special video. Uh, Teresa? Well, thank you and good afternoon to all of you. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be able to give this introduction to um, the video of Secretary Perry. Um, but I'm also very honored to be in the presence of such a, an amazing group of accomplished women. So the Secretary and I have been friends for many, many years. I worked with him on special initiatives uh, when he was governor of Texas, at that time I was a faculty member and endowed chairholder at Texas A&M University, and um, so he was governor for almost, well, a little over 14 years actually, so we, we got to know each other pretty well. Even at that time, his passion for STEM was very evident. Um, you, got, you guys may know this, but he originally wanted to be a veterinarian, and I am a veterinarian. Um, he says he couldn't get in. I think he was just destined for greater things, to be honest, but, um, but we, we definitely have that link. So beyond our common roots in Texas and our interest in animal health, we share a, long, a lifelong interest in education and preparing the workforce for tomorrow. So while Secretary Perry couldn't be here today, he did prepare a video, um, and he asked me to share his support and his, send his greetings to, to you all, or as we would say, actually, y'all. <laughs> and y'all know that the plural of y'all is all y'all, right? <laughs> it's all y'all. We're happy that you're here. Um, I do want to say I, I'm new to the department, but even in the short time I've been here, I've learned um, a great deal about the, the things that are being accomplished there, and I'm very proud of the work that they're doing. Um, from the classroom activities that they have on renewable energy technologies, to the Women at Energy page with profiles of women in STEM, to the conferences and days at the National Labs where they bring girls and teachers in um, to learn about the innovations and science discoveries. So a great deal going on, of which I am only beginning to sort of wrap my uh, arms around. So we thank you all for being here. I know everybody in this room is incredibly busy. We thank you for working with us and for constantly thinking about how we can do more to engage women in our energy future. And with that, I will turn it over to my friend and colleague someone I am very proud to be working with again, um, the Secretary, Rick Perry. Thank you for the invitation to join today and for your participation in the sixth annual C3E Women in Clean Energy Symposium. At this symposium, you will honor a group of esteemed women leaders in energy. They will join the growing ranks of award winners you've recognized from across the United States over the last several years. Regardless of whether you're an entrepreneur, an engineer, an instructor, or an employee of one of our amazing national labs, your work is vital to our future. Each of you here today helps advance innovation, connect new ideas with existing markets, and use technology to promote clean energy solutions. But even more importantly, your work will inspire the next generation of women leaders in STEM, and that is sorely needed. We all know the stats aren't good on this. Men are employed in STEM-related occupations at twice the rate of women. Our country needs more women majoring in STEM-related fields. We cannot afford to lose the scientific and technical talents of half the population or the generations that follow them. So thank you for doing your part each and every day to lead by example. At the Department of Energy, we're doing our part too. 
STEM-related programming and outreach are undertaken by programs across our DOE enterprise. And at every opportunity, my wife Anita makes it a priority to promote the substantial role women play in advancing clean energy solutions. We're also coordinating our efforts through a national platform called STEM Rising to showcase how DOE inspires students, teachers, and the nation's workforce for energy-related education and careers. People put themselves on an upward trajectory to lifelong success when they study STEM and pursue STEM careers, not just in grades K through 12, but in under and postgraduate education as well. We see it as a workforce development challenge, and we know we must inspire more women to enter into energy careers and to recognize and build the community of women leaders in this field. To this year's eight award winners, congratulations. Your work is as impressive as your successes are inspiring. And to C3E, congratulations on the sixth anniversary of this important initiative. Enjoy the rest of the symposium and thanks again for all you do to advance our energy solutions and to motivate the next generation of brilliant young minds. I'd like uh, once again to, to thank DOE for its engagement uh, in this initiative uh, and thank Secretary Perry for taking time to make that video. I think it's really important to emphasize at the very top uh, just how important getting more women into STEM and into leadership positions uh, is for all of our well-being uh, going forward. So I'd like now to, to introduce uh, a speaker to help frame uh, the meeting, uh, Amy Glasmeyer, who's a professor of economic geography and regional planning uh, in the Department of Urban uh, Studies and Planning uh, here at MIT. Uh, Amy uh, runs LARISA, which is the Laboratory on Regional Innovation and Spatial Analysis uh, in DUSP, as we call the Department of Ur Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, she's a founding editor of the Cambridge Journal of Regions, Economy, and Society, and she's a member of a number of other editorial boards uh, and organizations. Uh, her research focuses on economic opportunities for communities and individuals. Uh, among other issues, she investigates the role of geographic access and the effect of locational accident on human development. Uh, she's currently, I guess in her spare time, uh, she's writing a textbook on the geography of the global energy economy. Uh, she also has a project uh, called Goodbye American Dream that traces the ideology and opportunity that undergirds America's relationship to the poor. Uh, through analysis of uh, census data, popular media, and personal narratives, uh, she is exploring uh, the contradictions in this most sacred of constructs by demonstrating the ephemeral nature of economic opportunity uh, encumbered by locational accident, uh, institutional inertia, and unintended consequences of public policy. Um, this work and others of her work builds off of her long-running living wage calculator, uh, which analyzes minimum level of income required for individuals and families to pay for basic uh, living expenses. Uh, she has, amongst her other uh, activities at, at MIT, served as the uh, co-chair of MIT's educational uh, task force, uh, and in part while she did that, driving the energy studies minor uh, at MIT that enables all undergraduate students at MIT to have a focus uh, on energy studies. Uh, she's a graduate of Berkeley, holds masters, uh, professional masters and a PhD uh, in regional planning uh, from there. So with that, I'd like to welcome Amy to the podium to give her remarks. So uh, it's always a pleasure to come to this event. It feels so neat to be in a room with people who are 
inspiring and caring and energetic and real, really courageous, right? That's what I think of you all as, is courageous. Because um, it takes a lot of courage to be in business. It takes a lot of courage and effort to manage families. It takes a lot of courage to be leaders in political settings. Uh, and, and I can feel this sense of, of um, at the same time, understatement, no, no sense of you know, self-promotion. So it's, it's always really wonderful to be here. Um, what I want to talk about today is the confluence of a number of things that Bob sort of recited. My, I, I must sound like I have the attention span of a gnat at, when you hear what it is I do. But the whole, my whole career has been focusing on what is it that produces opportunity for people in places and what role does place play. And this last um, 12 years have been very challenging for parts of the country. Uh, and there still are lots of locations where the, the experience of recovery has not really taken hold. And I was trying to think about what I would have to say for, for all of you about what's going to happen next. And so I thought about the relationship between what I see in energy and what I see playing out in the economy. And the reason why I want to talk about it is because many of you, one way or another, will employ somebody. You will mentor somebody. You will inspire somebody. And the next period of time, I think, uh, that level of leadership that you demonstrate in those roles will become extremely important because it's a, it's a rocky road right now, and I think it's going to stay uncertain for some time to come. And that has to do with a lot of forces that are uh, outside of the consequence of the United States, but also there's a lot of tumult that's taking place within. And so what I want to talk about is, is um, basically a, a few things. I want to um, basically comment on the fact that people actually are pretty optimistic right now, and yet the economy is still in a very slow rate of growth. That the bounce that historically has come from the decline in the price of energy is not likely to manifest in the way that it has in the past. So we have to really think about that in terms of what it means for economic opportunity uh, and, and how uh, it, we, we may see energy price processes passing alongside of us, but it may have very little to do with actually what happens in the economy overall. Um, I want to talk about how we got to where we are. And I, and I want to talk about it because I want you to realize that it's only been about 35 years before the the kind of divergence between um, re recession recovery and job generation was uh, clearly denoted in our statistics. And so why I say that is because it means that we can actually potentially go back to a time when the economy was running in a, in a, in a manner that actually provides economic opportunity for a, a large portion of the population and not a select few. Uh, and then I'd like to talk about the workforce of today and tomorrow, because I think that's really the big challenge. There is a significant divergence in the generation of know-how and the actual job structure in the economy. And we are training people and educating people at the same time as our economy is moving away from the production of goods and high value added services and focusing more on human well being, which itself is positive, but on the other hand, it also has implications for the kinds of jobs and the level of economic security that people experience. So I'll begin by saying that. Uh, we have basically uh, gone from a rather dismal outlook to one that's a lot more optimistic in the population as a whole. And uh, that's really good because Americans uh, do best when they're happy. And they struggle and, and can be faced with discord when they're not. And it's pretty much across the board, except for the kind of characteristic less education, um, uh, less income, 
uh, where you see that people still have a sense that things are not perfect. And, and that's important to keep in mind because that seems to be a persistent trend over the last 40 years. Recovery or not, people's, people who have less economic opportunities and lower levels of education feel greater levels of vulnerability. This is the rate of growth that we have in the economy today. At this rate, it'll take about uh, 47 years for the economy to double. So the rate of growth matters a lot for the opportunity of people in society. And this low level equilibrium that we're experiencing has consequences, particularly for people who have uh, fewer opportunities, less education, and, and can be located in places where the resources are simply scare more scarce. Where does energy fit in this? So four years ago, um, thanks to, to MITE and MIT, I spent uh, three of the last four years teaching in Russia, uh, teaching in a program where people were learning about the global economy and energy systems. And when I started teaching in Russia, the price of oil was $140 a barrel. And when I left, it was about $50 a barrel. So I watched a country that had essentially all of a sudden demonstrated this openness and optimism to sort of shrink back into a sense of, of grave concern uh, and, and lack of direction, actually. And I think what we have to realize is the volatility in the price of energy is something we're going to live with today and into the foreseeable future, and that underpinnings of that are not just supply, but it's also international policy that is seeing us decarbonize the economy and the development of technological change that is producing goods and services that are simply using less energy overall. But for the, for the foreseeable future, I think we can expect that energy prices are going to be up and down, but they're not going to go dramatically um, up. And actually, when energy prices are up, the economy is growing. So it, we have this kind of funny problem um, at our doorstep. The other, the part of this is, though, the result of global geopolitical conflict and, and chaos in various markets. As everybody knows, there's a, a great deal of turmoil in countries around the world that are also energy producers, and we're seeing uh, uh, less easily anticipated changes in supply, which influence the overall um, energy price. So as it's uncertain, but we're seeing more come on market, but it's even uncertain when it's coming on market, so it makes things very unstable. Um, and we also have formulated policies that we wish to see through that will be decarbonizing the economy, which is positive, but if your economy is designed with a growth machine tied to energy, then you're going to have consequences that have to be managed. And I would argue there's very little connection between our national energy policy and such things as workforce policy, even though we really need that. So do I think it's going to revive the economy? No, I don't. I think that there's structural features over the last uh, 35, 40 years that would suggest to us that we're in, in a period of significant change. And what it means for us, for families, for women, for men, I think is, is really important to consider. So we see some structural features that um, we haven't anticipated in the past, and we are not completely sure what's driving it, but nonetheless, they're important to consider. So we know middle-income in jobs are declining. We know male labor force participation is declining. We know that part-time work is on the increase, and we also know that wage uh, inequality is on the increase, and for 60% of the population, wage wages have been stagnant for at least the 1970s. But more important to that is the fact that this table basically lays out what happens, has happened over the last sets of recessions. And the punchline is the following. The recessions have been deeper and they've had uh, more consequences. Women have recovered uh, more readily than men. Um, but we can see that unemployment is steadily rising over time. So the consequences of the recessionary flux has been um, quite negative. Um, interestingly, I focus on men in this particular conversation primarily because they're, they're almost like the canary in the, in the um, coal mine, in the sense that they are being dumped out of the economy at increasing rates, and uh, it, it doesn't really matter whether they're adding education or not. That seems to be having a diminishing influence on uh, their well-being. Interestingly, women track 
in the opposite direction, but you have to realize that we get paid 25 or 30 percent more, or 25 or 30 percent less, sorry. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Boy, I wish I could. <laughs> yeah, here's the pile of dough. Um, but the reason that I pay attention to this is because I feel like whenever anyone is left out of the economy, it's, it's a signal of some level of disposability, that people are disposable. And, and honestly, men have uh, been the ones who you know, did the dirty, the dangerous, and the dreary work. And as that kind of employment disappears, we're doing very little to actually try to figure out what that gap is going to be filled by. Women have a very different experience in the labor market. Our wages aren't rising, but our opportunities are slowly creeping up. But it's important to think about it just in terms of the disposability of Americans. The other issue is the, uh, the, the kind of flat income that we've seen. So since the 1970s, for a majority of the population in the United States, they've seen virtually no change in their income. So imagine that with the level of inflation and the level of variability that we've had, the amount of uncertainty, why were people angry? Why, why has the, has the, the, the public f felt so uh, disparaging and, and discouraged? It's because basically they are being able to buy less and less and do less and less, and their kids are doing less and less than they had anticipated. And we need to think about how we're gonna work our way out of that. This is just another indication of, of showing you, so we have hourly wages, and weekly wages, and then we have hours worked. So people are working less, and they're getting paid less, and they have less economic security in the form that their income comes in. So it used to be you would have a job, and you had a pretty good sense you were going to work 40 hours a week, and it was going to be an employer you were going to work with you know, day in and day out. That is changing dramatically, and, and with that, people's sense of well-being and security. Um, and, and this is probably the most disconcerting, which is that we are seeing a very dramatic increase in the number of jobs which are contingent. And, it, and I don't mean just driving Uber cars. You can go out to the, the uh, pharmaceutical system and the life sciences system here, and you can find all the sort of medium level new college grad type jobs, and they're being managed through contract services rather than solid uh, um, uh, full-time employment with employers where you have 401, health care, et cetera. And, and you, some of the reasons it's happening is because of the nature of the industry itself. Some of it is, this is what you call modern HR policy. What does it mean? It means that people are going to have to postpone such things as forming families and buying houses and cars because there's not enough economic security in this kind of a, uh, arrangement. So how did we get a jobless recovery? So it's not, it's not entirely a jobless recovery, but it's one that has a shape that ha has not been seen in the last three recessions. Basically, what's happening is it, it used to be that we'd have a recession, and what would form would be new businesses and physical establishments, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't be very big to start out with, but some of them, about 10% of them, would grow, and they would add significant numbers of jobs, and that's how we would reinflate the economy. This last recession has a pattern that I've never seen before, and I've been studying this same data for 30 years. Basically, at the end of the recession, there were hundreds of thousands of establishments that, were, that just simply disappeared, and they have not been recreated. The, the creation and destruction are now basically equal, and during the recession, there were more destruction than, than there was creation. Um, the fall off of new um, businesses is a reflection of the lack of new startups, so we're seeing fewer new organizations come into existence that have the potential to generate jobs. We're also seeing an amazing spatial pattern of extreme polarization in which very few places are actually the, the gaining the lion's share of new jobs, which has serious consequences for communities around the country. So this is just to show you that uh, um, in 1992 to 96, the net change in U.S. establishments was 420,000 in 2010, it's 166,000. So that's dramatic in light of the fact how much bigger the economy is today than it was in the earlier period. 
Here is a map that shows uh, the percent of the counties that lost jobs during the national recoveries. And what you can see is, over time, more places have been negatively affected by it. And you can see this kind of, that there, I, as a spatial analyst, I can't really read the pattern off of this because it's so widespread. And, and, and that means something is, I, I can't explain it. I don't have a structural feature to explain it with. In terms of numbers of counties that have actually gained jobs, it's uh, decreased through time. So um, you can see that uh, in 1992, it was 107 counties accounted for half of the recovery. Today, it's 73. So that means that 50% of the jobs that were created after the recovery are taking pl took place in 73 counties. There's 3,140 counties in the United States. So that's a remarkable um, statistic. Here's just a, a map to show where the job growth is uh, consolidating. And you can see 107 counties, 33% of the population, 50% of the jobs, 120 um, uh, counties, 33% of the jobs, 50%, and then 73, 34% of the population, and 50% uh, of the jobs. So basically, there are places that are gaining, and lots and lots of places are static or losing. Not only are it the, is it becoming polarized, but it's focusing in on the largest metropolitan areas where, all, where the majority of, of resources that are needed for economic growth are actually concentrated. So we're seeing growth essentially aggregate around poles of opportunity and not spreading out like it has historically done, which is what you would see if you look at this, right? So 27% was originally in the um, 20 with under or uh, in counties of under 100,000, and only 16% in the 1992-96 in the, uh, recovery period were in the large metro areas. And today, 41% of job generation is taking place in large locations, and and only 9% uh, in small. Well, what we did over the post-war period was geographically decentralize their population, and so there's lots of places that are basically marooned. And then here are the, the winners. So the top 20 that uh, um, basically uh, were the responsible for the majority of the new establishments formed. And it's a, it's a strange arrangement, but, but mostly it's uh, southern and western um, counties, and it's also within very few states. Uh, and then finally, this is where the employment growth can be seen as occurring. The reason why I um, make a point of showing this is because we know from the last election that our nation was becoming polarized. We knew that we had neighbors who weren't speaking to another, and we know that there are counties that are becoming increasingly homogeneous around certain kinds of social features. Diversity of points of view and, and diversity of sense of self is really important for social harmony. And if we can end up living in our own little hutches all by ourselves, there's going to be significant social consequences. So why cheap energy won't um, revive the economy, though, is not because of space, um, and uh, it's not because of some of the other features that I mentioned. It actually is because of the nature of the labor market itself. So basically, over the last 35 years, we've gone from being a goods-producing economy to a service-producing economy, and from a hard-good economy to a high-touch economy. That's great, because high-touch jobs are for women, but the fact that we're no longer a goods producing industry uh, economy means that energy prices are going to have less of an effect in the ability of the economy to grow. So cheap energy would be great, but if we're not making goods that use lots of energy, then it, that input is not going to have the consequence it has had in the past. This is just to show the, the types of jobs that have uh, been growing and declining. So here's goods production. So in 2004, it was 15%. Uh, it's projected to be 12% in 2024. Um, it's even, actually, this, this is uh, data which has to be readjusted because the number's actually now 11%. But you can see that we're losing um, hard goods and we're, we're gaining um, uh, service jobs, um, which are get great, but they pay less money. And in some cases, they are uh, the education that you build into the person actually does not produce the remuneration that it might otherwise um, warrant. Um, the industries that lost the majority of jobs are in the sort of, again, hard goods. These are industries which gain jobs, and these are the industries which are losing jobs. 
And what you can see is this is all of the manufacturing base, basically. Um, and these tend to be lower education, but they used to pay living wages, which, is w w which was really important to the story of the American dream. Um, uh, and what we can see here is basically the high touch economy, that is the jobs. And you know, it's not surprising, we're getting older, we have health issues and, and healthcare is a bigger portion of our economy, um, but we can't run an economy on healthcare alone. So what are the consequences? Um, I think we have a very significant portion of the population that feels economically insecure. So those of you that are gonna be employers, what's important to people is a sense that there'll be a job tomorrow, that they'll be paid for, what the, for the work that they do, and that there'll be some sort of security attached to the work that they complete. And, and all of those characteristics are not bundled in every job today. So if you're gonna be an employer, thinking in terms of how you're gonna do that is um, really important. Um, it's also true that what we're really seeing is the clearing out of the last vestiges of the post-war manufacturing industries that were by and large um, be beginning to erode simply because of cost differences around the globe. So with textiles and apparel, those jobs disappeared because they basically have been done in other places. But there are other industries which are, that are higher skilled that are also migrating and we wanna think about that. So what are the policies that we need to think about? First off, I would say we have uh, 20th century policies for a 21st century problem and we need to really think about what that means. Um, we um, need to look at our, our uh, uh, countries that are like ourselves in terms of economic size and capability and realize that they have policies that value humans and replenish capability so that people can have lifelong employment and we need to think about that. We need more R&D in lots of different forms, not as specialized as it is right now and it's extraordinarily specialized. Um, and we need to, to um, think about um, policies that are linked to the fact that our economy is so heavily service oriented um, because right now that's sort of an afterthought in, in much of what we talk about trade. And then the last I'd say is that we really wanna think about how to increase the potential exports of small and medium sized businesses because those are entities that will be generating jobs in the future. Um, so, I still think energy will drive innovation. I think that the decarbonization of the economy has taken hold and we're not gonna go backwards. Um, we're gonna have smaller footprints, not larger, and uh, I think we need policies that don't leave people behind. There's lots to do, thanks. <laughs>